Imagine a world where your lights flicker out not because of a storm, but because the wind stopped blowing. That's the challenge we face with renewable energy's intermittency. And this intermittency can make renewables really expensive when operating a grid 24-7, unless you do something really simple, really effective. Longline transmission is the key to producing reliable power with battery storage and renewable energy systems. So let's figure out how that works. There was a good study done by Bradkin et al. They showed that there were energy droughts for long periods of time in different regions of the United States. In the worst case scenarios, you end up with like 10 days of renewable droughts. That's pretty terrible as you're going to need really big battery systems to account for this disparity. Steinke et al. back in 2013 did a comprehensive review of studies looking at this problem. So the solution is what the authors called a copper plate. Basically, how connected is your grid? The more connections you have and the bigger that connection's area is, the less reliance you have on batteries. This bears out when we look at an analysis done by the Bank of America. They were looking at the performance of Texas and Germany. And guess what? The renewables performed terribly. They used a term called levelized full cost of electricity, LFSCOE, versus the more conventional system called levelized cost of electricity that I've shown in previous videos. The difference being that the LFSCOE considers the system completely operated by renewables within a single region, in this case, Germany or Texas. This results in huge 10-day or more energy storage demands, which drives up the cost significantly, whereas the LCOE analysis just looks at adding the system into the existing circuit. What does this mean for renewables? Well, nothing we don't already know. We know that renewables are intermittent, and we know that on small scales, that means a lot of battery storage. So in the Steinke review, they found that really small regions, like a city or a town, could have drought times as high as 90 days. If you increase that copper plate to more than 3,000 kilometers, you can reduce that battery capacity down to like two hours. So you can see how there's orders of magnitude improvement the more interconnection you get. This bears out in North American literature as well. There's a study conducted by Engahosi et al. I'm going to butcher that name, I'm sorry. And they looked at the interconnection between a number of different cases, regional, country, area, and integrated essentially just increasing this copper plate. Now this study did the exact same thing the Bank of America study did, but instead of calling it LFSCOE, they just broke out each part into their levelized costs and just called it the LCOE in order to align with most of the other studies done on this topic. So the LCOE primary was just the levelized cost of generating the power, what we've gone through in the previous studies, what's shown in the Lazard study and, and many of the other ones. The LCOC, the levelized cost of curtailment, basically how much power you lose. LCOS, levelized cost of storage. This is just battery demand. And then LCOT, the levelized cost of transmission. You can see how this encompasses all of the concepts that the Bank of America study did. We want to know how much power or how much does it cost in order to produce power 24-7 using renewables. As you can see from this table, the battery cost decreases at a faster rate than the transmission costs increase, making higher transmission integration more economically viable. Now, the regions used in this study were a lot bigger than the Bank of America, using just Germany and just Texas, hence why the total LCOE is much lower for their region cases. Nevertheless, it shows how much the energy costs fall when you integrate systems, fully dropping from $291 to $413 per megawatt hour in Texas to around $67 per megawatt hour in Texas when it's interconnected just within its small region. These prices drop further when you increase to the country scale, the area scale, or the fully integrated systems. And this beats out the nuclear case that the Bank of America was pushing. To compare this data fairly, though, let's look at land area, because that's what affects the copper plate. Germany is about 357,000 kilometers squared. Texas is about 695,000 kilometers squared. And the U.S. Southwest Central includes Texas and is about 1.15 million square kilometers. So nearly double what the Texas case was in the Bank of America study. The study used more than just wind and solar for this analysis, so we would expect it to perform better because it has a bunch of other integrated systems with it. But to compare the two studies, we're just going to use the wind energy since it can operate at night, which is the main reason that the Bank of America study is really high because they're looking at wind by itself and then solar by itself or how much it would cost to run all of those 24-7. That never happens in practice. They get integrated, which is why the Bank of America study is a little bit underhanded. Nevertheless, when we look at the cost versus land area, the results are very good, and the trend aligns really well with the other study. In fact, when we look at it in a linear relationship, we can see as we increase that copper plate, the costs come down dramatically. So we can see that the Bank of America isn't really a fair comparison, because we know how renewables are supposed to be installed. And if you ignore interconnection, and you ignore expanding that copper plate, then they ignore the best tools for cost reduction. It's almost malpractice on them. 
I'm actually really disappointed in the Bank of America for not doing this study more comprehensively because we've known this type of information for decades. So I ask you, do you think it's harder to build carbon capture and storage facilities and nuclear power plants or transmission lines? You know, those things that are everywhere? It's a bit of a trick question because Canada and the United States already do this. Last year, BC alone transmitted 11.4 terawatt hours to the US and imported 7.4. This is also done extensively in the EU and they're looking to expand it even further. In mid-January, Alberta had a lull in the renewable energy output, something that wouldn't have been a concern had we built more interconnection. The interconnection is the key to this entire problem. It brings the costs of renewables down, it brings it below fossil fuels, you get what is essentially coverage between different areas. So if one area has a whole bunch of power and another area has really low power, those are able to be balanced, and that reduces your curtailment. Good thing that solar, wind, battery storage, and energy transmission are all tried and tested technology. If you're against cheap power, energy independence, and you have a bad sense of economics, then be my guest and follow policies suggested by people like Polyev, Dan Crenshaw, and other conservative politicians on this topic. In my next video, I'll show you the math behind these analyses. If you think I'm wrong or cherry picking this data, then be my guest and send me the references that you have. I would love to read them. I'd love to see where I'm making a mistake. Thanks for watching. As always, all of the references are down below.